U.S. President six to ten. Greetings to John Quincy Adams. He was born on July eleventh, seventeen sixty-seven, in Braintree, Massachusetts, and his father was John Adams, the second president of the United States. From seventeen ninety-four to eighteen o one, John Quincy Adams gained a lot of political experience by being appointed as the Secretary of State to both Holland, Netherlands, and Prussia, Germany. In 1802, Adams was elected to the Massachusetts Legislature, and became part of the U.S. Senate. One year later, he changed from a Federalist to a Democratic Republican. Adams has taken part in the negotiation of many important treaties, such as the Treaty of Paris. It is obvious that John Quincy Adams had contributed a lot to the United States and was prepared to take on the role as president. The presidential election of 1824 was very controversial. John Quincy Adams was neck and neck with Andrew Jackson. Jackson received the most votes and should have been the most supported candidate, but he didn't receive the majority of total votes. The United States Constitution states that a candidate must receive the majority of all the votes, or the House of Representatives will get the power to vote for their desired candidate. Henry Clay, another candidate of the election, instructed his supporters to aid John Quincy Adams because they had similar opinions. So Adams ended up receiving more votes in the House of Representatives than Jackson. Many Americans were angry because they believed Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams cheated Andrew Jackson out of his presidency. Adams was similar to his father because the both of them were stubborn and headstrong. During Adams's presidency, he came up with many ideas that were futuristic but unrealistic at the time. He wished to build highways and pathways to connect different parts of the country, and some other programs that involved scientific research. His plans didn't receive a lot of support or cause any impact. His personality made Americans feel distant from him. Which caused him to lose the next election and get succeeded by Andrew Jackson. After leaving office, John Quincy Adams served the American people tremendously in many affairs, such as the anti-slavery cause. Adams died February twenty-third, eighteen forty-eight, two days after he collapsed in an argument to honor U.S. veterans. Fun fact: During his inauguration. He invited U.S. citizens to the White House, which led to massive chaos and his nickname, King Mob. Meet Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was born March fifteenth, seventeen sixty-seven, somewhere in between North Carolina and South Carolina. Unlike most presidents, he grew up in a poor household and served in local armies since he was a teenager. His family died due to the harsh times of the Revolutionary War, so Jackson really hated the British. He studied law and eventually became wealthy due to his hard work. In 1796, he served in Congress for a while. He later became a general for the Tennessee militia, and had a victory against the British in the Battle of New Orleans, which was during the War of 1912. He led his army to New Orleans and beat the British troops that were twice the size of his militia. Interestingly, the Treaty of Ghent had already been signed before this battle, so the victory had no impact on the results of the war. Nonetheless, Americans were proud of this victory by Andrew Jackson. Jackson became known as a self-made man and a war hero who cared for the common folk. When he ran for president. Most lower-class citizens voted for him because many other candidates had come from wealthy families. He lost to John Quincy Adams during his first run, and won the second one. After becoming president, he received the nickname "People's President" because he preached the rights of the common folk, which made him very popular among citizens. In the political world. Jackson wasn't so popular because he would use his power as president selfishly and veto bills that he didn't like personally. Jackson had many scandals and controversies during his presidency, such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forced Native Americans out of their homes, 
and the Dred Scott case, which declared that African Americans weren't considered U.S. citizens. Many people were angry that Jackson passed such unfair and unjust laws. Although Jackson was controversial, his followers all had great reasons to love him. He was a skilled army general and a successful man who built his wealth without a wealthy background. Due to this, he was a role model for many Americans even after his death at the age of 78. Fun fact. The first attempted assassination of the president targeted Andrew Jackson, but it failed and he beat up his assassin. Hey look, it's Martin Van Buren. Van Buren was born on December 5, 1782, six years after the colonists declared their independence from Great Britain. Before becoming a politician, he was a young lawyer that supported prioritizing states' rights over the federal government's. In 1812, Van Buren served two terms in the New York State Senate. Van Buren was then elected to the United States Senate in 1821, where he opposed the John Quincy Adams administration. He later became governor of New York in 1829. He supported Andrew Jackson in the 1828 election, which led to a new political party, the Democratic Party. He gave his position of governor up after President Jackson invited him to be his Secretary of State. Before becoming president, Van Buren was nominated by the Democrats to be vice president. While being vice president, Van Buren stood on the same side as Jackson, opposing the reach harder of the Bank of United States, which was vetoed in 1832. During the next election in 1836, Van Buren defeated William Henry Harrison and successfully took office in 1837. However, soon after Van Buren became president, the United States was hit with a financial panic, the Panic of 1837. This was caused by the failure of hundreds of banks and businesses throughout the country. Because of this panic, Van Buren failed to be re-elected during the election of 1840. In 1844, Van Buren failed, once again, to gain the presidential nomination of the Democrats. In the next presidential election in 1848, Van Buren ran again, but this time as a Free Soil candidate. The Free Soil Party was made of abolitionists and anti-slavery Democrats who wanted to stop the spread of slavery. During this election, Van Buren received around 10% of the votes though he failed to win a single state. After 1848, Van Buren retired, where he watched the issue of slavery tear apart the country, and also completed his autobiography, which provided many valuable insights into the political history of that time. Martin Van Buren died July 24, 1862, almost a year after the Civil War started. Fun Fact Van Buren was the only president who spoke English as a second language. Please meet President William Henry Harrison. Harrison was born in Charles City, Virginia, February 9, 1773. Coming from a wealthy family with over 50 slaves, he was considered to be part of the planter aristocracy, which is a category of upper-class Americans. Harrison studied history and medicine when he was younger, then joined the army in 1791. During his service in the army, he led some troops and won battles against the British and Indians, helping him build a reputation in the hearts of the American people. From 1816 to 1828, William Henry Harrison served in the U.S. House of Representatives, Ohio Senate, and United States Senate. In 1836, Harrison ran for president and lost to Martin Van Buren. However, he won the following election by a small amount, one reason being that he was less aristocratic than Van Buren, who was known to act snobbish. During his inauguration, Harrison had a long speech in the rain and caught a terrible cold that developed into pneumonia. He died soon after and only served in office for a few weeks. His vice president at the time was John Tyler. Fun fact, 
William Henry Harrison had the shortest presidency out of all the presidents. Greetings to John Tyler. He was born on March 29, 1790 in Charles City, Virginia. He graduated from the College of William and Mary in 1807 at the age of 17. Then he went on to study law under private tutors. In 1811, at the age of 21, Tyler was elected into the Virginia legislature, officially starting his political career. He served in the legislature for five years until 1816, then became a member of the U.S. House of Representatives in 1817. He favored states' rights over federal power and wanted to strictly follow the U.S. Constitution so he opposed many policies that would give the federal government power. In 1823, 23-year-old John Tyler married Letitia Christian. In 1825, he became the governor of Virginia. After two years as governor, Tyler went on to represent Virginia in the U.S. Senate. There, he grew unhappy with the policies of President Jackson and joined the Whig Party which was established in the early 1830s to oppose Jackson's policies. In 1839, Tyler's wife suffered a stroke, which left her partially paralyzed. Two years later, Tyler became vice president, with Harrison as president. Unfortunately, Harrison died abruptly in office after serving for a few weeks. John Tyler officially became president on April 4th, 1841 at the age of 51, younger than any of the previous presidents. Once he became president, Tyler vetoed bills the Whig party supported. This led to the Whigs expelling Tyler from their party. In 1841, he signed the Preemption Act, allowing people to purchase 160 acres of land from the government. In 1842, he signed the Webster-Ashburton Treaty, which ended the Seminole War in Florida and settled a dispute between the United States and the British colonies over boundary issues. That year, his wife, Letitia Christian, also died from a second stroke. In 1844, Tyler signed the Treaty of Wangkia, which gave American access to Asian ports. Tyler also signed bills making Texas and Florida states of the Union. During the next election, Tyler dropped out due to no support. He died on January 18, 1862, at the age of 71, likely due to stroke. Fun fact, Tyler married Julia Gardiner, making him the first president to marry while in office. This is the end of U.S. Presidents 6-10. Thank you for listening.